Hi, welcome to Time Warp Wife Ministries. I'm your host, Darlene Schatt. And this week, we're looking at chapter two in our Bible study on Ezra. Chapter two, no, actually chapter one, it's our second video. But chapter one is called Raised Up for a Purpose. If you haven't gotten a copy of the study guide yet, this is what it looks like. You can pick it up at amazon.com. It's Ezra Bible Study, Rebuilding the Temple, Restoring the Heart. And if you can't afford a copy of the Bible Study, just go to my website and click on the link Studies. You'll find everything that you need there to get started and to join us in this study. So if you do have your study and your Bible, open them up and we are going to start at Proverbs 21 verse 1. It says, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, as the rivers of water he turn it whithersoever he will. This truth could not be more evident than it was in the days of exile. We saw King Nebuchadnezzar used by the Lord to bring his children into captivity. And once again, we see a pagan king being used by God to free them in the story of Ezra. The Bible refers to Cyrus as God's anointed shepherd in the book of Isaiah. You see, this movement wasn't something that Cyrus decided to do out of the kindness of his heart, but rather it was God working in him and through him to begin his good work. Philippians 2.13 tells us, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. What's interesting to note is that this return from captivity was prophesied several years before by the prophet Isaiah. I love how the book of Ezra is so interwoven with these other books. But even more fascinating yet is the fact that Isaiah's prophecy was so specific. Now listen to this. This is so cool. That he pointed to Cyrus by name more than 150 years before he was born. Let's take a look at that. Open your Bible to Isaiah 45, verses 1 to 4. And we're going to read that together. And you'll see Cyrus's name. Remember, as you're reading this, it was written 150 years before the book of Ezra. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel mine elect, I have even called thee by name, I have surnamed thee, that thou, though thou hast not known me. The Lord called Cyrus by name, not because he was a king, not because he was anything special. He simply called him by name for a mission in the same way that he calls you and I. Not because of anything that we have done, but because God has chosen to use us. God could have easily chosen a Jew, but he chose to use Cyrus so that the prophecy might be fulfilled. Here's a really interesting side note I wanted to point out. And you'll see if you, if you have a copy of the study guide that throughout the chapters, I have these little did you knows and they help us to kind of get a little picture of, of the history, some um, traditions and just some really interesting things that I want to point out. According to the laws of the Persians and Medes, a written degree, a written decree could not be reversed, even if the king himself had a change of mind. What you'll see throughout the story of Ezra are a lot of written decrees. Um, we see this in Esther chapter 1, verse 19, where it says, Let it be written in the laws of Persians and Media, which cannot be repealed. And again in Daniel 6, 8, where it says, Issue the decree to put it in writing so that it cannot be altered, in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. Isaiah 45, 13 if you can turn to your Bible again, we'll read that. And I like to highlight mine too in there. It says, I have raised up in righteousness and I will direct all, I have raised him up in righteousness 
and I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city and he shall let go my captives, not for the price, not for price nor reward, saith the Lord of hosts. And there again, he's talking about Cyrus, how he would be, um, uh, how he would be an instrument that God would use to um, have the city rebuilt, to have the captives free, and to um, begin God's work at once again on the temple. When I see the words, I have raised him up, I'm reminded that a calling from God doesn't happen in a split second. It might feel that way sometime, but the fact is that our mission is a lifelong process of preparation. Every trial we go through and every person we meet is yet another step directed by God. I'm reminded of the many ways my plans have failed, the days that my plans fell through. What I didn't see then is that I wouldn't be where I am now if I was steering the ship. In fact, I would have sunk it a long time ago with my off-the-cuff plans and impulsive decisions. I'm also reminded of the many times that things have worked in my favor. The days when things just fell into place, those things that I feared which turned out to be nothing, opportunities that knocked on my door and other doors that were open. How many of those have I chalked up to good fortune, to luck, or to chance? Perhaps I didn't use those words exactly, but I can tell you that's what I thought, at least some of the time. The thing is, things don't just fall into place. If they did, I wouldn't have to clean my kitchen every day or make my bed. It would just fall into place, wouldn't it? When my boys walk into a clean kitchen, it's because I went before them and cleaned up the mess. When my kids were young and we'd all sit down for dinner, it was because I went before them to prepare a meal. If we can understand that, maybe we can see God's work behind the scenes. Maybe we can start to give him thanks where thanks is due, and maybe we'd understand that he's directing our steps. The Bible tells us, a man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. Proverbs 16, 9. God was using Cyrus just as he used Nebuchadnezzar 70 years before. Remember what God said about Pharaoh. I have raised up for this very purpose that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. All of the good and the bad is just another step closer to where God is taking you. Does it mean that God orchestrates sin? Absolutely not. But remember that what Joseph said to his brothers in Genesis 50 verse 20. But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Ask yourself if you would be at the place you are now without the good and the bad, if you would prosper under the hand of God without first being tried by the fire. I'm reminded of Esther, who, like King Cyrus, was raised up for a purpose. Every detail, including her family history, her beauty, and her poise, was designed to lead her to a place where God would use her as an instrument of his power in saving his people. Esther 4, 14, one of my favorite verses, it says, For if thou altogether holdeth thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise from the Jews from some other place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? And so as you read this chapter, keep that in mind. Remember that Cyrus was raised up for a purpose. Nebuchadnezzar was raised up for a purpose that God's people might go through that time of captivity, that they might be tried, and that their hearts would return to the Lord. And that's all for this chapter. Um, I will see you again for chapter two, which is, let me see what chapter two is. Oh, a chosen priesthood. Go to my website at timewarpwife.com and you'll find everything you need to continue with the study. I'll see you later this week for chapter two. Bye-bye.